Let me welcome everyone to our hearing this morning, um, the price of uncertainty, how much the DOT's proposed billion-dollar service rule can cost co consumers. Um, we want to get started. I'm glad we have our, uh, my friend and ranking member here, our, uh, Mr. Kucinich. Um, I'll start with our opening statements. And uh, I got a longer opening statement than normal, so I'm going to I'll read fast, Mr. Mr. Keep it fast. This last week, ordinary people across this, this great United States have engaged in the annual traditioning of shopping for Christmas gifts, rising at pre-dawn hours to take advantage of Black Friday sales and Cyber Monday deals. The shopping season is vital to the survival of so many small retailers. The vast majority of all retailers and 80 percent of all U.S. communities depend solely on trucks to deliver and supply the products sold in stores or ordered online. At last count, trucks moved $8.3 trillion worth of goods annually, facilitating nearly 60 percent of the economy. Unfortunately, these merchants and professional truck drivers who bring the goods to market have a very real reason to be worried this year. The Department of Transportation, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, has produced a multi-billion dollar regulation, the Hours of Service Rule, that threatens to raise prices and cut revenues this holiday season, further jeopardizing uh, our fragile economic recovery. DOT's Hours of Service Rule, which is one of only seven regulations President Obama admitted impose an annual cost of at least $1 billion on the economy is being reviewed at the White House as we speak. This regulation will hurt an array of job creators, from truckers to grocers to bakers and retailers, all of whom rely on trucking to operate. The rule, which has received nearly 30,000 comments, has been the subject of widespread and bipartisan concern. Critics of the rule include multiple Democratic senators and the administration's small business watchdog, the Small Business Administration's Office of Advocacy. At this time, I would like to enter into the record a comment letter from the Office of Advocacy to Administrator Farrow. Without objection, this is so ordered. In February 2011, I joined with a bipartisan group of 122 House members who wrote the U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary, Mr. LaHood, to express the concern that altering the current hours of service rules is unnecessary and would result in more trucks and drivers on the road to transport the same amount of goods, increasing final product cost and congestion on the Nation's already overcrowded highways. This letter points out that the proposed rules could actually decrease safety because they could cause drivers to rush, adding stress and increasing the likelihood of an accident. While I support the goals of increased highway safety and reducing the driver fatigue, this rule appears to be a solution in search of a problem. Even DOT admits that, quote, the data shows no decline in highway safety since the implementation of the 2003 hours of service rule and its readoption in 2005 and the 2007 interim final rule. Moreover, trucking-related accidents are at an all-time low. The Department of Transportation's own data shows that 2009 saw the largest annual decline in fatal trucking accidents on record. Meanwhile, the number of truck miles traveled and the number of registered trucks has increased from 221 billion miles in 2004 to 288 billion miles today. The number of registered large trucks has also increased by nearly 3 million. Accordingly, it appears the current rules are working and are striking the appropriate balance. In order to justify the expensive regulation, it appears the DOT is playing games with the numbers and is using fuzzy math in an attempt to justify their action. One of our witnesses today will explain how DOT is rigging the system. At this time, I would like to also enter into the record a report by Edgeworth Economics entitled Review of FMCSA's Regulatory Impact Analysis for the 2010-2011 Hours of Service Rule. Again, without objection, this is so ordered. This report highlights the intentive, uh, excuse me, inventive methodologies and improbable assumptions DOT uses to increase the apparent net benefits of the rule. When real-world assumptions are used, this study finds that the rule will impose a net cost to society. I also want to emphasize that there is a strong bipartisan agreement on the need to ensure and improve highway safety. However, it is my sincere belief that the regulation as currently proposed could actually have a negative impact on safety. The purpose of today's hearing is to bring transparency to the rulemaking process so that we understand the full consequences of Federal regulation before it becomes law. And with that, I now yield to the distinguished member from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding this hearing and uh, for the opportunity to um, make this presentation. This, this question is being framed around how much the proposed rule, which limits the number of hours commercial truck drivers can be on the road, could, could cost consumers. But I, I would respectfully submit that a 
far more appropriate question is whether this proposed rule will help ensure that all of our loved ones will be safe and able to enjoy each other's company. It is the proposed uh, rule. It is what it is all about, is saving lives. Truck driver fatigue is a serious safety problem that threatens everyone who gets on a highway every day. Each year, on average, 4,000 people are needlessly killed and 100,000 are injured. 100,000 are injured in truck crashes. Evidence suggests that truck driver fatigue is a major factor in these um, crashes. Under the hours of service rule currently in effect, truck drivers can drive more than 77 hours a week. I mean, think about that. You know, we are all used to uh, thinking about a 40-hour week. When Congress is in session, we probably put in an 80-hour week, some of us at least, I would say. And you get tired. But if you are driving a truck with all of that uh, machinery and mass in motion, there are consequences when fatigue sets in. I mean, there is a human dimension here that cannot be ignored. And under the amounts of driving currently allowed, 65 percent of drivers reported that they often or sometimes felt drowsy while driving. 48 percent they have fallen asleep while driving in the previous year. And I will say, say this again. You know, we, some of us here have been in legislatures. Some of us had to drive a great distance to legislatures. When you are on a schedule and you know, a legislature is in session, it, you know, if you have a long drive, you can get drowsy. What, I've, it's happened to me. It's happened to all of us. It happens. And we have to realize that truck drivers are not immune from this. You get the combination of these tired truckers driving loads up to 80,000 pounds. It can make a lethal weapon that we don't want alongside our families driving on highways. There are brave people in the audience today who came to support stricter standards for truck drivers because they have been unfortunate to have felt firsthand the devastating effects of truck driver fatigue. Now, uh, Ed Slattery is here with his son, Peter, and they have submitted the statement for the record, Mr. Chairman, which I would uh, like. But I, I want to read from parts of, the re of, of his statement. So the members of this subcommittee and others will know the real cost of truck crashes involving tire truckers. And so, you know, with, without objection, I would like to submit the, his entire statement for the record. Ordered. But, but I want to quote from some. It is a compelling testimony. Mr. Slattery, thank you and, and, your, and your son for being here. It was a beautiful, clear day on August 16, 2010, when my family's lives were changed forever. My wife, Susan, and our two sons, Peter and Matthew, were returning home from a big family reunion in Rocky River, Ohio, which happens to be in my district. Uh, that was the home of Susan's parents, George and Ginger Palmer. Susan grew up in Cleveland, and all of her family still lives in Ohio. Uh, I, I, Mr. Slattery writes, I would have been with him, but I wasn't able to travel because I was recovering from shoulder, shoulder surgery. As they neared the 190-mile marker on the Ohio Turnpike in Streetsboro at around 11.45 a.m., a truck driver behind the wheel of a triple trailer truck had fallen asleep and crashed into the back of our car. Mr. Slattery writes, in an instant, I lost my wife and Peter and Matthew with emergency surgery. Following the impact with our car, the truck went on to hit two other semis and four more passenger vehicles before stopping in the divider and bursting into flames. The weeks following the crash were spent juggling surgeries for both boys, meeting with doctors, lawyer and lawyers, and funeral directors, all while ensuring that someone was always at Peter and Matthew's side. For some time, I spent each day wondering if Nat Matthew would, be, uh, would make it to the next. After about a month, the boys were stable enough to return to Baltimore, where we began a journey dealing with the long-term effects of a crash, including the loss of my wife, Susan. Peter, who was suffering a, bro a broken pelvis and facial fracture, was conscious and being moved to a helicopter when he overheard the paramedics pronounce his mother dead. He will recover physically, but the long-term psychological effects are yet to be determined. Matthew, who is in a coma from massive head trauma, continues to make progress every day, but is permanently disabled and requires round-the-clock care. Our lives will never be the same, but I can work to reduce truck driver fatigue so that another family will not have to suffer the tremendous loss that my family lives with every single day. If adopted, a proposed rule will save lives, improve driver health, reduce costs to society. I urge the subcommittee not to impede the progress the Department of Transportation has made to improve the HOS rule and to protect the safety and well-being of our families. Uh, Mr. Uh, Slattery and Peter, who are here, I, I just want you to know that, uh, uh, that we are going to be very sensitive to the concerns that are expressed here, and we thank you very much for uh, attending this hearing so that you can listen to the testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank the, uh, thank the ranking member for his statement. Let me also express on, on behalf of the chair and the entire committee our, our uh, sympathies to the Slattery family and to, uh, and to your son, Peter, and, and the loss you have suffered. Uh, obviously, we are uh, 
we are all concerned about safety, and we just want to make sure that whatever rule is put forward does, in fact, uh, uh, protect people as best we can, but also is, uh, takes into account the economic concerns that I think are, are valid as well. So um, I appreciate that uh, from, from our ranking member. Does the uh, gentlelady from uh, New York wish to make an opening statement? No, thank you. I yield back. Okay. We will we'll get right. Uh, this gentleman from uh, the doctor from uh, Tennessee have any? Okay. We will get right to our, uh, uh, right to our witnesses. And uh, let me, let me uh, introduce uh, first, we have Mr. Ed Nagel. Uh, is President and CEO of Nagel Companies in Walbridge, Ohio, and has been involved in the trucking industry for over 30 years. Uh, we also have Mr. Glenn Kiesall, who is the Executive Director of Transportation and Logistics for the Associated Food Stores uh, Company. Mr. Rob uh, Mackey is President and CEO of the American Bakers Association, has served on, uh, on the Food Industry Coalition for hours of service regulation, so worked directly with uh, the issue in front of us. We have Mr. Frank Miller, Director of Logistics at Babcock and Moore, a home furniture company headquartered in Mulberry, Florida and has worked on transportation issues for over 20 years. We have with us also Mr. Henry Jasna. Um, he was Vice President and General Counsel for Advocates uh, for Highway and Auto Safety, and Dr. Jesse David, who is an economist and Senior Vice President at Edgeworth Economics with 15 years of experience in regulatory policy evaluations. Uh, pursuant to the rules of the committee, all witnesses are sworn in, so if you will just please stand and, and uh, um, uh, raise your right hands. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give uh, will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And if you do, just nod in the affirmative. Let the record show that everyone uh, uh, answered in the affirmative. And we are going to start with Mr. Nagel, and then we will just move down the line. Uh, you guys know the rules. You get five minutes and stay as close to that as you can. Um, and then we will get to our, our questions uh, once we have heard from all uh, six of you. Mr. Nagel. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Uh, in addition to being employed in the trucking industry over 30 years, I grew up in it as my late grandfather began driving after World War II and then ran several trucking companies, including his own, until retirement. Our company, we service most of the top 10 food manufacturers as well as the largest food distributors in the United States. There are two elements of this proposed hours of service reform that are, will critically affect the industry, the reduction in the allowable driving hours from 11 to 10 and combined with a 34-hour restart provision that requires two consecutive midnight to 6 a.m. off-duty periods. For our company, this effectively reduces our ability to generate revenue by 17 percent, as in our operation, our drivers would be limiting to, limited to working 50 hours a week from the current 60. Our cost of operations, just fixed cost, is $75 an hour with, the, with our equipment, changing it to this uh, proposed uh, 50 hours our fixed cost now becomes $90 an hour with nothing more than the stroke of a pen. FMCSA states that we note that the proposed rule, so on and so forth, without significantly compromising a driver's ability to do their jobs and earn a living. And I need to ask Secretary LaHood what his definition of significant is. Basically, they are admitting that a driver's ability to perform his duties and earn an income will be compromised. Our truck payments, our driver's wages, our insurance costs, and all the associated costs of business don't go down just because our ability to produce revenue has been restricted. The current proposal is effectively influenced by the Teamster Union LTL daytime only drivers. That represents 10 percent of the entire industry workforce, and by placing great emphasis on the studies, that are essentially based on an irrelevant percentage of an entire trucking industry is a smokescreen. It is an illusion that what is being proposed will be a, a one-fit-for-all one panacea of solutions for an industry that is safer today than at any time in recorded history. In order for our company just to break even with all the proposed constraints, we would need to raise our rates about 20 percent. They will have a serious hyperinflationary consequence on our economy, and households will be suffering the most. Since 2003, there has really, really been no um, prior, excuse me, since 1938, there have been no substantive changes in the hours of service. Since 2003, this will be the fifth proposed change. What has occurred in our industry over the last eight years requiring so many legislative actions? Sadly, those of us who eat, sleep, breathe, and live transportation 
feel that politics is becoming the pulse of our industry and not pragmatic supply chain solutions. Since 2003, there has been a 33 percent drop in truck-related fatalities, as well as a 40 percent drop in truck-related injuries, not only on a percentage basis, but on a per million mile basis. Has significantly We have lost a very important provision starting in 2003 and, and eliminated its entirety in 2005, which is the split sleeper berth provision. That was one fundamental logbook provision that gave our drivers the flexibility to comply with hours of service in, in the areas of which they get involved in unpredictable and out of control situations. The receivers will not let us drop. You know, our equipment stay there for 10 hours, and, and we are being forced at times to run illegally because we are out of hours till we get to a safe haven. As an industry, we are asking that even though FMCSA acknowledges the lack of available rest areas, provide us the opportunity and the drivers to remain legal with the flexibility of finding a place that, that can accommodate them comfortably. So in summary, please keep the 11-hour driving rule maintain the current 34-hour restart provision that would not include two consecutive midnight to 6 a.m. off-duty. And if we can continue to, uh, uh, to get that sleeper berth provision, uh, that would be a tremendous benefit to the industry. Thank you very much, and best wishes to you and your families for the holiday season. Thank you, Mr. Nagel. Uh, Mr. Kiesel. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Glenn Kiesel. I am the Director of Transportation and Logistics for Associated Food Stores based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Associated is a retail cooperative founded in 1940. We are a privately held company that provides grocery products and services to about 500 independently owned retail supermarkets in eight Western states from three warehouse distribution centers. Thank you for inviting me today. Today's hearing on pending hours of service rules. My testimony is presented on behalf of Associated Food Stores and the Food Marketing Institute which represents retail supermarkets and food wholesalers throughout the United States. I plan to summarize and ask that my entire written testimony and attachments be made part of the record. Mr. Chairman, Associated Foods strongly supports the current hours of service regulations. We do not support the new hours of service rules that are being proposed by the Department of Transportation for the following important reasons. The pending hours of service rules will not be good for the grocery, grocery store industry, as they will not be good for my company and, in particular, our truck drivers. The proposed hours of service rules will also negatively impact consumers who shop for groceries in our stores. If DOT decides to finalize this rulemaking, it will adversely affect my company in terms of costs. I have done a quick economic estimate on the proposed rules to our Far West warehouse. Under the HOS proposal, if we are to maintain the same level of service to our retail accounts from our Auden facility, we will need to make a capital investment of $1.7 million for new equipment, namely tractors and trailers. A new tractor with the sleeper costs about $116,000, and the trailer costs about $75,000. We will incur increased costs such as salaries and benefits for additional drivers, totaling more than $200,000 annually. In this regard, I am very worried from a strict safety perspective that we won't be, have enough qualified drivers available to fill our future needs under the new HOS rules. I should mention that since the inception of the current HOS rules, Associates Truck Fleet has traveled 52 million miles. During this time, we have had eight preventable DOT recordable accidents. This translates to 0.15 accidents per million miles compared to the national average of 0.7 accidents per million miles. In addition, Associated has not had a, a single inspection resulting in our equipment or drivers being put out of service. We are proud of our safety record and don't want to see any changes that might negatively impact it. My company will also incur additional fuel and maintenance costs for newly acquired equipment over $100,000 along with expenditures for insurance and miscellaneous fixed costs. As such, the total cost of the rulemaking for our Ogden warehouse will be well over $2 million. For an industry that operates on a profit margin of 1 percent, any new costs resulting from the hours of service proposal will be felt immediately. Earlier, I mentioned that DOT rulemaking won't be good for our truck drivers. With its reduced drive time, the rules will mean more layovers for them. My company is proud of the fact that over 65 percent of our drivers are able to go home and be with their families after they complete their shift. But this won't be the case under the hours of service propo proposal. This means our drivers' quality of life will suffer. 
I have a letter from one of our drivers who traditionally does a route from, from the Far West Warehouse to stores in Twin Falls, Idaho, that I would like to enter into the record. This run takes about 10 to 11 hours. The reason he likes his job in this route is that he gets to spend the night at home with his family. But under the new rules, he will have to sleep in his truck two to three nights a week. Consumers, unfortunately, will be paying more for groceries because their transportation costs will increase. The proposed rules will also mean increased transportation costs for all agriculture-related sectors, from farmers all the way to retail. Sadly, consumers who live in rural areas will be hurt most, with the, with most in terms of how much they will be paying for their groceries because of this rule banking. With the current economic recession, we can't afford any unnecessary and costly regulations such as the new hours of service proposal. Higher prices for groceries would be tough for families who are already struggling financially, especially the 14 million Americans who are unemployed, the millions of seniors living on fixed incomes, and, and for those who are dependent on domestic feeding programs such as WIC, whose benefits won't buy as much when food prices go up. It is difficult to project how much the proposed hours of service rules will ultimately cost consumers, but we know there will be increased costs that will unfortunately have to be passed along. To conclude, we believe the current hours of service rules are working well, and we see no quantifiable reason to change them. The rules that are on the books are easily understood. They are promoting safety and compliance. Over the past seven years since the current hours of service rules were put in place, fatalities and injuries involving large commercial vehicles are down by more than one-third. As a matter of fact, fatality and injury statistics are at their lowest levels, even though the number of miles driven is increasing. Our industry strongly supports the current hours of service framework, and it should be retained. Thanks for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Mr. Kesaw. Mr. Mackey. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, my name is Rob Mackey, and I am the President and CEO of the American Bakers Association. ABA is the voice of the wholesale baking industry and advocates on behalf of the $102 billion baking industry, employing 630,000 skilled employees at more than 700 baking and supplier facilities around the country. ABA members produce bread, rolls, Thanksgiving pies, tortillas, and many other wholesome, nutritious baked products for America's families. The wholesale baking industry currently operates the fourth largest fleet of vehicles behind the Postal Service. FedEx, and UPS. ABA greatly appreciates this opportunity to provide its perspective on the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's hours of service regulations. The majority of ABA members utilize their own fleets of vehicles for the interstate distribution of baked goods to their customers. The industry views itself as bakers and not as trucking companies. Driving is incidental to the true function of route sales representatives, which is sales and customer service. The wholesale baking industry makes its living on delivering the freshest possible product to grocery stores and restaurants. In addition to the safety of the industry's employees and the public, the idea of a truck with a company or family name on the side of it involved in a traffic accident is a huge incentive to operate in a safe manner. The nature of many bakers' distribution systems involve operators making repeated and sometimes lengthy stops during the course of their workday. Route sales representatives may make a couple dozen stops in a single day. They spend more than half of their time in non-driving activities, servicing the customer, stocking shelves, or in-store marketing activities. The rule at the heart of today's hearing marks the fourth major rewrite of this regulation by FMCSA in the past 12 years. The current hours of service regulations have been effective in improving safety as demonstrated by the current crash data trends. The safety performance of trucks has improved at unprecedented rates under the current hours of service regulations. The number of fatal accidents and injuries involving large trucks have declined by more than a third to historically low levels. Given these facts, we find it difficult to understand the rationale for added regulation, especially one that even FMCSA recognizes would disproportionately and negatively impact the short haul segment of the trucking industry of which bakers are part. Uh, typically, DOT has treated the vehicles that our industry operates uh, similarly, even though, as you can see, they are very different vehicles indeed. According to FMCSA, the relative costs and benefits differ considerably between the long haul and the short haul segments. Most of the costs arise on the short haul segment but all of the purported benefits come from reducing long-haul crashes. Fatigue and fatigue-related crashes are considerably less common in short-haul operations, where the operator is typically returning home at the end of their workday. 
FMCSA crash data indicates that commercial motor vehicles less than 26,000 pounds account for 52 percent of registered trucks, but account for 10 percent of fatal accidents and 14 percent of nonfatal accidents. Clearly, any fatality is too many. But logic and cost-benefit analysis dictates that any regulatory effort be proportional to the risk. Another undue burden would be created by the proposed change in the 34-hour restart provision requiring drivers to rest a minimum of two consecutive complete nights. This would do little to promote driver safety in short haul operations and wreak havoc with finely tuned distribution systems. A typical route sales representative will not have two consecutive days off, as bakeries are down on Tuesdays and Sundays. Also, most deliveries by bakers take place in the early morning, the very hours required by the rule that they be at rest to ensure that local grocery store shelves are well stocked with the freshest possible product for customers. Many baked goods have four to five days of shelf life, making timely delivery critical. The change to the 34-hour restart provision outlined in the rule could also require short-haul operators to deploy more equipment and resources during peak commuter driving hours. This could adversely impact safety and air emissions, while also negatively impacting productivity for both the drivers and the customers. This may result in lost sales as well as production delays. If the new hours of service regulations become effective, it will be more difficult and costly to deliver products, increase traffic during the most congestive times of the day, and result in more dangerous roads. In conclusion, there is little safety benefit or rationale to change the existing rules. Again. The proposal would require significant changes to baking industry distribution systems, would impact employee work hours, and increase the cost of delivering fresh bakery products. Ultimately, the consumer will feel these costs at the checkout aisle. With the high unemployment and high food inflation, now is the worst time to be pushing regulation for regulation's sake. ABA appreciates this opportunity to provide input to the subcommittee and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mackey. Mr. Miller. Chairman Jordan, members of the subcommittee, my name is Frank Miller and I am the Director of Logistics for W.S. Babcock Corporation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here today to testify on the Department of Transportation's proposed changes to the driver's hours of service regulations. Today I will testify on behalf of W.S. Babcock Corporation and the National Retail Federation. Babcock, the NRF, and its members strongly support the current hours of service regulations and question the need to make changes. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Agency must consider significant economic impact that changes to the current hours of service will have across the industry, including the impact to retail operations at both the store and distribution center level. Unfortunately, we do not believe the proposed changes meet these requirements and will have a significant negative impact on the industry, the economy, and potentially driver safety. W.S. Babcock Corporation is one of the largest privately owned home furniture retailers in the United States. Founded in 1904, Babcock has been operating for more than 100 years with 300 stores and 1,200 associates located throughout the southeast. As the world's largest retail trade association and the voice of retail trade worldwide, NRF represents retailers of all types and sizes, including chain restaurants, industry partners from the United States, and more than 45 countries abroad. Retailers operate more than 3.6 million U.S. establishments that support one in four U.S. jobs, 42 million working Americans. Contributing $2.5 trillion to annual GDP, retail is truly the daily barometer for the nation's economy. Badcock's transportation network consists of more than 45 tractor trailers, which run more than 4 million miles annually in eight southeastern states and a fleet of delivery trucks operating from Badcock stores to the customers' homes. In addition, Badcock tenders more than $3 million in freight annually with U.S.-based common carriers. We estimate that the proposed change in hours of service rules could increase transportation costs for Badcock by 10 to 20 percent annually. For Badcock, this would result in an estimated increase of approximately $2.8 million annually. We are also concerned about the possibility for adverse, unintended consequences as a result of the proposed changes that could lead to further increases in cost. For Badcock, a reduction in driving time from 11 hours to 10 hours would affect an estimated 11 percent of loads, resulting in an approximate cost of $1.5 million. 
force the company to increase driver compensation or retain drivers, and increase its fleet size and pay higher rates for trucking. The changes to the 34-hour restart could affect an estimated 6.6 .6 percent of Badcock loads a year, resulting in an additional annual cost of $940,000. Those common carriers utilized by the company would most certainly also be impacted by the change. We feel the changes will result in more lost carrier productivity that will be passed directly to the consumer as millions of dollars in rate increases. In addition, it is important to note that distribution networks are experiencing increased demand, which is expected to grow substantially. This is significant as the economy continues to recover from one of the worst recessions in history. Additional trucks and drivers will be necessary to meet this growing demand, regardless of the hours of service requirements. Adding new capacity will be extremely difficult, as there is currently a shortage of available, safe, qualified drivers. We are also concerned about the potential adverse impact on road and highway safety and on many environmental investments in the supply chain and transportation industry. The proposed changes to the hours of service rules may increase the number of trucks deployed to move the same freight while restricting the ability to move a portion of this freight during non-peak commuting hours. In the transportation sector, many retailers are actively pursuing strategies to greatly reduce their carbon footprint in the supply chain. Many of these initiatives involve efforts to reduce hauls and deploy trucks as productively as possible during nighttime hours. To conclude, on behalf of W.S. Badcock Corporation and the National Retail Federation, I again would like to thank you for this opportunity to testify during today's hearing. On behalf of America's retailers, we urge the FMCSA to maintain the current hours of service regulations which are working, and I look forward to answering any questions the members of the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Jasny. Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, and members of the Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs, and thank you for inviting me to testify today. I am Henry Jasny, Vice President and General Counsel for Advocates for Highway and Auto Safety, a nonprofit coalition of public health, safety, consumer groups, and insurers dedicated to advancing highway safety. Advocates has worked on truck safety issues and driver fatigue in particular for 20 years, participating in national summits the hours of service regula regulatory docket, which we filed many comments on, and uh, in the legal uh, litigation that has been ongoing. Truck crashes are a serious and deadly problem that kill thousands and injure tens of thousands of people each year. Even with a recent decline in large truck crashes, over 3,380 people were killed and 73,000 injured in 2009. This is equivalent to a major airplane crash every other week of the year. The annual cost to society remains over $40 billion. To put a face to these statistics, I know that Mr. Slattery was introduced and his son Matthew earlier by um, Ranking Member Kucinich. Also in the audience is Marshall Woods, who lost her college-age daughter and a friend to a tired trucker crash uh, in 2002. The DOT estimates that crashes involving truck driver fatigue kill as many as 500 people a year, but the actual number we think may be twice that figure. We think that this shopping Christmas season, consumers will want to know that when they go to pick up their bargains, and that they can return home safely without running into a tired trucker. The research and the science support reform of the HSO, HOS rule. Studies have found that since the current HSO, HOS rule went into effect, large numbers of truckers admit to falling asleep behind the wheel while operating commercial motor vehicles that weigh up to 80,000 pounds. We saw one slide with statistics regarding nearly half of the truckers who were polled in 2006, after this current rule was went into effect, said they had fallen asleep at least once in the prior year. Those statistics are a clear warning that driver fatigue remains a major safety problem that needs to be addressed by a change in the rules. The 2003 final rule, on which the current rules are based, contradicts the scientific research and evidence regarding fatigue and the FMCSA's own findings of fact. The basic principles are straightforward. Driving and working long hours causes fatigue, as shown in truck crash data. Crash risk increases geometrically after the eighth consecutive hour of driving a truck. Driving during the eleventh consecutive hour exposes both drivers and the public to an additional hour of danger when the crash risk is at its highest level. Allowing only 34 hours off-duty instead of taking more time for rest and recovery, as was allowed in the prior rule before 2004 results in cumulative fatigue due to lack of sufficient sleep. 
And finally, truck drivers need between seven and eight hours of sleep each night between shifts to be alert while driving. FMCSA found that drivers get less than six hours of sleep on average between work shifts under the current rule. Since the current HOS rule violates those basic principles of science and it is fundamentally flawed and needs to be revised. Furthermore, claims that there is no safety problem under the current rules or that the current rules have contributed to safety are false. I have no scientific support and no basis in fact. They are literally junk science. The legal decisions also support reform of the HOS rule. The two unanimous decisions of the U.S. Court of Appeals that vacated the rule reinforce the view that the current rule is unsafe and needs to be reformed. The initial decision held that the lack of the analysis of the driver health issue was fatal to the rule. The Court went on, however, to point out that many legal deficiencies in the agency's reasoning abounded. Among them, the Court questioned the legal sufficiency of the agency's justification for the 11-hour limit and rebuked the agency for not addressing cumulative fatigue resulting from the short 34-hour restart provision. The judge who wrote that initial opinion was a, nominated to the Federal Court bench by uh, Senator Jesse Helms. The court, uh, cost of uh, reform of the rule. Not reforming the hours of service rule will cost consumers and taxpayers billions of dollars in deaths, injuries, and crash costs, as well as driver health costs and shortened lifespans. The benefits to society of the option supported by advocates, the 10-hour rule, far outweigh the cost and was re result in an economic benefit to the country of between $380 million and $1.2 billion annually from reduced impacts on driver health coupled with the prevention of numerous deaths and injuries and crashes. The reform option also supported by advocates also cre would create 40,000 new driver jobs. This is a major benefit to society at a cri critical time for job creation. This is in stark contrast to the current HOS rule, which eliminated nearly 50,000 jobs since it took effect in 2004. Unfortunately, not all companies have good safety records like Mr. Keyshaw's company, so they need to be governed by regulations that will keep them in line. And finally, in closing, I would like to say that uh, the Edgeworth analysis that uh, you have introduced to the record recommends that there be no calculation for uh, driver health and safety costs, medical costs. And th we think that that is an unreasonable position and that if that was adopted by the agency, that that would build in an um, uh, arbitrary and capricious argument if the rule goes up on uh, review to the Court once again. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to introduce my uh, written statement to the record. I would also ask the statement of Marshall Woods. I would like to submit that to the record, and I would be ready to answer any questions. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Jasny. And let me also express on behalf of the Chair and the Committee our, our sympathy to the, the Woods family. Um, and thank you for being here today. Um, Dr. David. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, um, I am an economist and a vice president at Edgeworth Economics, a consulting firm here uh, based here in Washington. I have a Ph.D. with a specialization in public finance and environmental economics and 15 years of experience uh, in regulatory policy evaluation. I was retained, my firm was retained by the ATA to analyze the cost-benefit calculations in FMCSA's uh, RIA. My report uh, focuses on whether the agency's methods uh, are accurate and consistent with current data and compares the agency's approach to the approach taken in previous RIAs. Uh, to summarize, the proposal to restrict driving time to 10 hours a day from the current limit of 11 hours. Uh, FMCSA estimates lost productivity costs of about $1 billion per year and benefits of about $1.4 billion per year related to reduced crashes and improved driver health. Uh, so the net benefits estimated by the agency for that option are about $380 million per year. To obtain these results, FMCSA made several changes to their previous approaches uh, used in previous RIAs. I find that in every instance, the new methods increase the purported benefits uh, of the proposed rule. However, many of these new approaches misapply available data, uh, use outdated information, or lack empirical support entirely. And I will describe here three of the, the most significant issues. First, FMCSA uses outdated information for lar on large truck crashes. Uh, since the proposed rule is intended to reduce crash frequency, obviously this is a, a key input to the analysis. FMCSA uses a figure of 434,000 crashes per year, uh, which is approximately the rate of crashes 10 years ago. Uh, before the current HOS rules were implemented. 
Uh, large truck crash crashes, however, have fallen steadily since then, uh, recently falling to 286,000 in 2009. That's 34 percent lower uh, than the agency's figure. Uh, and I'll note that decline was occurring uh, before as well as during the uh, current economic downturn, uh, as you can see from a chart which I attached uh, to my testimony. FMCSA's use of old data inflates the benefits of the proposed rule by about $250 million per year. A second issue relates to FMCSA's calculation of the fraction of crashes caused by driver fatigue. Obviously, this is another critical assumption since the proposed rule would affect only those types of crashes. Uh, in, two, in the 2007 RIA, FMCSA concluded that fatigue was a factor in about 7 percent of crashes. Uh, the agency now uses different methods and, uh, and data, in particular, excuse me, in particular the Large Truck Crash Causation Study, or LTCCS, and calculates a figure about twice as high, 13 percent. However, however, the agency's new method is flawed. Uh, FMCSA inappropriately assumes that each associated factor identified in the LTCCS for a particular crash was the cause of the crash, even if multiple factors were present. So, for example, suppose investigators identified three associated factors for a crash, a particular crash, prescription drug use, speeding and fatigue. The agency assumes that eliminating only driver fatigue would have caused that crash to be avoided. This new method contradicts FMCSA's own conclusions in the LTCCS report when it had acknowledged that each associated factor should not be considered to represent an independent cause of a crash. Increasing the assumed fraction of crashes caused by fatigue from 7 percent in the previous RIA to the unsupportable 13 percent figure inflates the benefits of the proposed rule by $330 million per year. A third issue relates to the benefits of increased sleep time for driver health. Previously, FMCSA had concluded that existing HOS rules did not adversely affect driver health. The agency now, however, includes substantial health benefits from small increases in sleep time within the normal range of 6 to 8 hours. And in fact, according to FMCSA, about half of the total benefits of the rule would come from this rather than from reduced crashes. One problem with FMCSA's approach relates to the application results from a study by Ferry, a sleep researcher. Ferry measured mortality rates for a cohort of British civil servants in the 1980s who had reported sleep levels in the categories of five hours or less, six, seven, eight, and nine hours or more. While Ferry did find increased mortality associated with the lowest and highest sleep levels, the researchers found no statistically significant differences between the mortality rates of people who reported between six and eight hours of sleep. Other academic research confirms this conclusion. For example, Capuccio found there is no evidence that sleeping habitually between six and eight hours per day in an adult is associated with harm and long-term health consequences. FMCSA cites the Capuccio study but ignores this key finding. I understand that Professor Capuccio has submitted a report into this docket stating that the agency misinterpreted his research to support its conclusions. FMCSA's unsupported assumptions about reduced driver mortality inflate the benefits of the proposed rule by $690 million annually. Uh, in addition to these three issues, there are other unsupported assertions and methodological errors in the RAA which further inflate the apparent benefits of the proposed rule. Uh, if these problems are corrected, I find that the new rule would result in a net cost of about $320 million annually rather than a net benefit of $380 million as calculated by the FMCSA. Um, I, I note that Mr. Jasny stated that, that we had a recommendation uh, that the new rule not include benefits from, from uh, improved driver health. Uh, that is certainly not my position. I just believe the calculation should be done based on the most accurate and best available data. Uh, I thank you for your time, and I, I encourage you to read my report uh, for additional uh, information on these thank questions. You, thank, thank you, Doctor. Let me just start with you. Uh, Mr. Jasny, his testimony said that this uh, new proposal would create 40,000 jobs, and then we just heard from four witnesses, the first four witnesses who said it is going to cost them more money, this, this new rule, yet Mr. Jasny says it is going to create more jobs. As an economist, uh, what is your take on uh, what may happen with the new rule? Well, the goods still have to be transported. Um, so under the FMCSA's assumption, the drivers who are now driving are going to drive fewer hours. Those hours would need to be replaced. Uh, I assume that their income would go down and possibly someone else's income would go up. Perhaps there would be some new drivers. Um, uh, I think the overall amount of driving probably uh, wouldn't change that much. Okay. On the okay. Let, me, let me come to Mr. Uh, Mr. Mackey. Um, it seems to me the current rules are working. We got the safety numbers have been good. Um, 
that is with increased miles we have seen, uh, 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 in increased trucking miles over the last uh, decade. Is, is, I mean, is, is, in fact, the current rule working, in, in your estimation, just the way it is supposed to? Well, it is certainly not perfect as, a, as it applies to short haul, and, and we continue to work with DOT on, on some issues around the edges. But, but by and large, it, it works, and the data, as we have heard today, clearly illustrates that. I mean, it is a pretty substantial reduction, 30, 33, 34 percent reduction in, in those accidents involving trucks. I mean, mm -hmm. So it seems to be working pretty well. And, and would you also agree that, that there is the potential, at least, um, if the new rule is put in place, that we could see um, uh, potentially more accidents, we could see a, a harm to the safety record, because as uh, Mr. David just talked about, there will now be more drivers on the road. My understanding is the way the rule would work as well. There would potentially be more drivers on the road during the daytime hours when there is also more just people, the you know, non-truck drivers out going, doing the shopping, going to work, doing the things they do. Um, is that a fair assessment? No, it absolutely is. I think you will get a few. Our members indicate they would have to hire swing drivers to cover those additional hours, um, frankly, to be on the margin of, of safety and error so they don't run the risk of going over the reduced hours that would be available. Uh, similarly, the, particularly in our industry, as, as Mr. Keyshaw can attest to, you know, we are delivering products in the early morning hours, 4 or 5 a.m., so that when the customer walks in the store first thing right. in the morning, they have right. fresh bread. Um, and so you are going to push those um, hours into the daytime hours, um, and it is going to be what about What about the midnight rule? Uh, do you think there is also the potential, we would like to not think this, but also the, possibly the potential that some drivers may want to drive a little faster to beat that, to beat that deadline? I think that is a, I don't have any data to back that up, but clearly but it's, it's human kind of, nature indicates they are going to want to get home sooner. Fair to assume that they may try to, when an increased speed means increased chances of, of accident, increased chances of harm. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, and, then, and then, so uh, it seems to me the current rule is working. There is the potential for increased safety concerns uh, under the new rule. And as we have heard from the first four witnesses, all this is going to create more cost. And, and I, would, I would still argue that there's a, there, you know, the idea that we're going to have more jobs, I mean, I, I, just basic economics says, okay, let's, uh, what's, the, what's the example we always get in economics class? Let's go break everyone's windows so that we'll have to hire more people to come fix the windows. Uh, we created jobs, but did that really add to the overall economy, add to wealth, add to what we want to have happen in our economy? I, I would argue this is in, in some ways moving in that direction. So it just doesn't make sense to me. Mr. Nagel, talk to me a bit, little briefly about the 34, moving from the 34-hour rule to the, to the consecutive nights and what that may mean. And it seems to me that is the one that could be a potential big cost to, uh, to trucking companies. Uh, that is potentially a, a real problem because of the fact that it, it, you may have a driver that gets in after midnight, could be 12 15, 12 30, and he now has to literally go 54 hours till his next available driving time. So he's going to lose an entire day of productivity, ultimately a day of his wage, and the, and the company itself is going to have the same loss of revenue, uh, increasing our fixed cost uh, per hour even further. Drivers are going to stay away from home longer. Um, FMCSA states that even though they don't have the statutory authority to address the lack of available rest areas and accommodations for truck drivers, um, it is going to cause these guys or force these guys to stop in areas where there are no accommodations. They are going to be in shopping mall parking lots. They are going to be just pulled off the road on some of the major highways. They are not going to have rest. You know, essentially forcing a guy to stay 54 hours in an area the size between the uh, top and lower bunks of, of your children's homes is inhumane and cruel. They are not going to have any restroom facilities. They are not going to be able to have uh, hot food or, or any of the accommodations. How somebody can rest better under those conditions is beyond my, my reasoning. So uh, the quality of life is going to diminish further. And, uh, product to the, and for our area of service, we are a regional carrier that services primarily the East Coast from the, the Baltimore, D.C. here up to the, uh, Portland, Maine. Um, it is going gonna, it's gonna to re just reduce our productivity substantially. Thank you, Mr. Nagel. Uh, my time is up. I will yield now to the ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, since the debate here is really monetizing the cost of regulation versus monetizing the cost of not having uh, effective or better regulation. 
I, I just want to submit for the record uh, uh, two uh, documents. Uh, one uh, speaks to the regulatory impact analysis for the HOS proposed rule estimates that based on a 10-hour work uh, day, the monetized annual safety benefits and driver health improvement benefits range from below $300 million to more than $2.4 billion in quantifiable benefits from reduced crash and injury costs, lower medical and health uh, payments, and longer, healthier driver life expectancy. Uh, I, I, and one of the you know, you can't just talk about the cost of regulation which, without looking at the uh, compensating factors if you don't have the extra costs from these crashes. Now, how do you monetize the cost, going beyond that, to the Slattery family or the Wood family? You know, there, I, actually, juries do, which is one of the reasons why the Insurance Institute of Highway Safety filed uh, the research arm of the industry filed an amicus brief in a lawsuit that supports and affirms the problem of fatigue. And our insurance companies that are members of advocates for auto and highway safety, they support reducing fatigue. If we are going to have a hearing on, on the cost, and, and, and I, I think it is a legitimate question, what are the costs? But you have got to weigh it in terms of what are the costs to society the, on the other side. If you don't do both, you don't really get a fair reading. Uh, now, Mr. Nagel, I, I want to ask you questions about a company that my staff has identified. My staff found that there is Nagel Toledo, Inc., which is listed on the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration Safety Measurement System uh, as DOT 423609. Uh, you are here as the CEO of the Nagel companies. I have, uh, uh, I, I have a copy of the bio that was submitted to this committee that, uh, uh, that goes over your involvement in the industry. And it, um, it has you as CEO of Nagel Companies, and it also lists uh, Na Nagel Toledo, Inc. as one of the companies that you lead. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I, I want to discuss something with you, because uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's Compliance Review, which I have a copy of here, of Nagel Toledo, reviews uh, or reveals serious hours of service and other safety violations. Now, according to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, uh, Nagel Toledo has received 12 unsafe driving violations within the past year and 23 over the past two years. Now, that is in this report. Is that information accurate? That is correct. And the Motor Carrier Safety Management System also shows that Nagel Toledo has received 13 fatigued driving violations within the past year, 32 over the past two years. In the past year, nine of the 13 violations resulted in an out-of-service order, including seven violations for requiring or permitting the driver to drive after 14 hours on duty, one false report of driver's record of duty status, and one violation for requiring or permitting the driver to drive more than 11 hours. Uh, is, is this information that was given to the government, is that correct? That is correct, sir. And is it also true that uh, Nagel Toledo has been involved in two Department of Transportation reported truck crashes over the past year and five in the past two years? Is that correct? Uh, I would have to defer that uh, the report is probably correct. Okay. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, you're, I understand you are you're here opposed to going back to the uh, uh, 10 hour limit on consecutive driving. Uh, but help, help us in this committee in terms of your own experience, your own experience. How, how is that practical? And how, and how can I take your testimony based on, on the record that is in here? You know, help me square your, the record that is in here with your testimony, Mr. Nagel, please. Uh, thank you for those points, and I am glad to address the issue. Uh, first of all, the uh, with stepped up CSA enforcement at the beginning of the year, we also did the same on our internal controls. What that report doesn't tell you is there were seven or eight offenders during that time period. Prior to that audit, we had fired four or five of those individuals because of those violations, and that was prior to the audit. The other two or three were on their final warning and had since been terminated, 
before we even received that report back from the, uh, the POs, PUCO. But, now, but we take you, that very seriously. Well, I, I, listen, I imagine, I mean, you're running a company, you have to take it seriously because Correct. there is a bottom line you have to be concerned about. You have to be concerned about your insurance costs. But what I'm wondering, as a boss, you've got workers who are putting in all, you know, all these more hours. Don't you have some concern that they might be working too many hours and it makes you, your company vulnerable, if not just your company, you know, the people uh, in the larger community? I mean, don't you have a concern about that at all? Sir, I have a tremendous concern about that. In fact, we, I personally spend time educating the general public about sharing the road and also communicating to them that our drivers are not just these killer trucks that some of the uh, people try to portray. It is more than just a cost-benefit analysis. Okay? I have a moral obligation to make sure that our drivers operate in a safe fashion. Now, part of the, the uh, issues that came up, fatigue is probably one of the most misnamed things. It just, and several of those were literally a clerical error where they, the driver misadded uh, his hours of service. But more importantly, with the split sleeper berth issue that uh, I mentioned briefly before, and it is in my written report, when one of our drivers will go into an area that is you know, heavily populated, we get detained above beyond the hours of service. Well, they are not allowed to stay at a customer in Brooklyn or wherever the place may be. We are forced at times during a period of time to drive illegally to go to a safe haven. So I would say half of those uh, violations will result in the logbook changes that have occurred over the last five years. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate your indulgence in giving the witness uh, time to respond, because I know that expanded the time that I had. I just want to add this, if I may, with your, the Chair's indulgence. Um, you got rid of some of these employees, so there would be a little bit more than a clerical error. And, and, the, re, and the only point I am making, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for being fair here, and that is mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it is important to hear from Mr. Nagel, but look, um, there, there are issues of fatigue here that we can't gloss over. That's my point. I, I you know, I, I'm not, you know, I didn't, I didn't rip you apart. Right. For this record, you know, it, mm -hmm. we can do dramatics here, but I'm not interested in that. I just want to point out that this issue is a legitimate issue of driver fatigue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, real quickly, before yielding to the chairman of the full committee, M Mr. Kesal, do you want fatigued uh, and unsafe drivers on the road representing the companies you represent? No, that was not. Mr. Mackey, do you? Absolutely not, uh, Mr. Miller. Do you? Absolutely no, not. because I mean it's 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 in your it's in your best interest for the for the well-being for the for the profitability of your company. In fact, I would assume many of the trucks that are on the road that for you guys and Mr. Nagel as well, you probably have uh, the sign I've seen. If you don't like my driving, call a number. Do you have some of those signs on your truck? Absolutely, Mr. Mackey. Absolutely, Mr. Keesaw. Yeah, uh, Mr. Miller. Do you? We don't, but we are in the process of implementing electronic. Law. And I assume that I assume that the reasons, Mr. Mackey, that you have those in the back of your truck, because did you probably get some in, in benefit from insurance-wise, insurance payments, or you just want the public to know that if your company's name is on the on the trailer of that truck, that you got safe drivers there. So it's it's there's market forces involved in in, in a safe record as well, right? No, there's clearly a margin, a, a economic benefit, but clearly these drivers, and particularly in our industry, I mean, they're 20, 25 year employees, so there's a family connection there as well. I yep. mean, we don't want these people to get yep. hurt any more than anybody else does. And Mr. Nagel understands the concern because when he had viol uh, drivers who weren't following the rules, he got rid of them because he understands that's in the best interest of the safety, but also in the best interest of his, his company. Correct, Mr. Nagel? That would be correct. All right, thank you. I yield now to the, to the chairman of the full committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to thank all the uh, members of the subcommittee senior to me for yielding. I appreciate the indulgence. Uh, I'll go to the same four folks. With all due respect to the last two uh, witnesses, I really think this is about uh, people who actually operate trucking fleets here today and what is the practical implication. I know the numbers are not supported based on path arithmetic. I know that the numbers are supported slightly based on current arithmetic. But let's go through some of the arithmetic and how it uh, impacts you. Mr. Nagel, I will start with you since you, uh, your record was called into uh, to question. Hopefully those signs on your trucks uh, say, and please don't call while driving because you are going to be distracted <laughs> as a car driver following that truck. Uh, the number one issue of the Department of Transportation's uh, 
overall Cabinet officer at Ray LaHood is, in fact, distracted driving. Isn't that as much a part of the problem that accidents and problems and even tickets that your drivers receive have a lot to do with their lack of focus, not necessarily how long they've been up, but a lack of focus? Isn't that one of the, the major points that you look for in your drivers? One of the things that we have found out is typically it's not because of a distraction. When they're stopped, and again, it's because of up, you know, increased enforcement. They'll use another reason to check a driver's logs for stopping. It could be a marker light that's out. The driver could be going three mile an hour over the speed limit. So the, the fatigue factor or logbook factors have not been the reasons for their stops. It's been for something else. Well, Mr. Kesaw, uh, I, and I, I've had the opportunity of driving large rigs in my, not, in my quite distance past, including uh, more buses than trucks, but my father had a, truck, a trucking company, a trucking repair company primarily. Uh, the one thing I find interesting about particularly large rig drivers is that their ability to be employed depends on their, their record, no question at all. You lose a record, you lose your employability. But I, I, here's the other thing that I always question. In your experience, the four of you as operators or overseers of operations, is there anything in these new regulations that is going to ensure eight hours of restful sleep? Anything. Now, are you all familiar with the crash in Buffalo in which two pilots were so tired from having flown across country and then gotten on a plane and being up for endless hours, even though their actual duty day was only a couple of hours, when they looked at the ice building up on the wings and apparently were so tired that they couldn't figure out that they were going to crash? Now, FAA has regulations about sleep. There actually is our regulations. They have tried to create regulations about duty day. But they have the same problem that you have. Nothing in this regulation, and I saw all positive heads knocking, nothing in this regulation is going to guarantee that the driver goes to bed and stays in bed and sleeps well for eight hours. If we are not actually guaranteeing rest, uh, the last two witnesses that talked about these studies and the, what they showed, it doesn't mean the darn thing. If you have got sleep apnea, you can be off the road for 54 hours and come back just as incapable of being a good driver. Now, for the four that have operated, how many of you have fired people for drinking within the window of their driving, either just before, during, or after? All of you? You have all fired people for drinking. Same question. Is anything in this regulation going to know that when they leave work for the prescribed period of time that they are not just going to the bar? So you can come back tired with a hangover having actually driven for maybe six or eight or ten hours to go see mom in, uh, uh, in, in upstate Michigan from Toledo, and you come back and you have met all the requirements of this new regulation, but in fact you are not fit for the next ten or eleven hours. Isn't that true? Would the gentleman yield? Not yet. Uh, the, uh, is there anyone that, that knows of anything in this regulation that is going to ensure that you actually have rested drivers? versus ensure that you have drivers that are simply available for duty about 10 percent less time? Nope. I yield to the gentleman from Ohio. I, I want to thank Cleveland, my, not Toledo, but, but you know. I, I want to thank my, uh, my friend for doing that. You know, we are not really here to talk about whether drivers go to bars or owners, you know, drink at home, okay? That is not the point. We're, you know, the, the bottom line here is who is running the business? It's not the, it's not the drivers who are running the business. You're, you are a businessman. I respect that about you. I mean, you bring a dimension to this Congress because you understand business. Um, my dad was a truck driver. You know, he wasn't calling the shots on how many hours he worked. He had a contract. That had something to do with it. But well, re reclaiming my time, are any of you aware of a study that shows that the duty day in the eleventh hour for a well re or the tenth hour actually going into the eleventh cutoff? That, the, that during that time there is a significant dis, 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 diminishment of capability. In other words, for any of you, and, and Mr. David, Dr. David, I actually would go to you. You have looked at these studies. These studies are about how long you sleep. If you were to, from the economic material you reviewed, if you were to view the risk of the 11th hour, assuming that you got a good night's sleep, that you are well rested, competent, not distracted, and sober, 
and, not, and having been sober, let's say, for the previous 24 hours, was there anything that would tell what the, the actual risk of the 11th hour was? And if so, was it scored? I, I think the, the studies show that the risk of a fatigue-related accident does increase. I think the issue is how many of those are there and how many would be reduced by this regulation. Exactly. If you were to score just the 11th hour, if you will, or the that the difference between 10 and 11, if you were to score that, what would the accident ratio and or cost be in isolation? Because as I see it in this, the study that supports this regulation, you have to throw in the, the cart, the horse, the buggy, the whip, and everything to get slightly into a positive ratio of a cost-benefit. Isn't that true? I found that the ratio was negative using the best available and the most current available data. And I note that the only way you can get to that negative is by including the issues related to driver health, not just the crash issue. Uh, right. If you just looked at the number of crashes, I think FMCSA would agree under their own analysis this, the, the answer was in the negative territory. Last question, Mr. Uh, very quickly. Mr. Isn't, it isn't it true that, that more crashes occur, occur in the first part of a shift than the last part, the drivers actually have a poorer record in their first four or five hours than they do in their last four or five hours? Mr. Dr. Be, Mr. Nagel, since you have been picked on, when do these crashes occur? Uh, typically in the first four hours of their on-duty status. So real-world, dirty fingernails, you do the job, you look at these people. The fact is you are more concerned about them going out not rested in those first four hours than the last hour based on real world experience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. I think the Chairman yield now to the gentleman from uh, Mr. Ohio. Chairman, may I, I have a response. Quickly, I would just quickly. like to be right ahead. quickly. That for one thing, uh, crashes in the 11th hour, while they are not as numerous as in the earlier hours, that is only because most drivers are driving the first eight hours. Not all drivers are driving the 11th hour. But the risk, the rate of crash is much higher in the 11th hour. And that has been shown in the earlier hours. That is statistically very and Will you make that available, the studies for the record? Absolutely. Um, I and, Chairman, and if I may, there's, my appendix. There's, without objection, there is a research report and study showing adverse health and safety effects of longer working hours and adequate rest time. Without objection, I would like to submit that. I, I appreciate that, although I didn't quite hear the last part. You said an inadequate rest. So it is a combined longer study. Longer working hours and inadequate rest time. It shows an adverse health and safety effects. This is from uh, advocates for highway and auto safety. And, and Mr. Chairman, although I, I, I don't disagree with the unanimous consent, I do want it to be noted for the record that the combining of long work hours and inadequate rest makes a different point than the actual period of time that you work. Inadequate rest is something I think we are all here on the dais wanting to figure out how well you would get. Well and I, without objection? Without objection. Thank you. Sure. The gentleman from Iowa is recognized. Let me start by asking the panel, how many of you have actually worked as a licensed truck driver in your lives? Any of you? I have. And I can tell you from personal experience that the level of stress on a truck driver goes up in direct proportion to what is going on in their workplace environment. If you are hauling grain during harvest season in Iowa, you have a lot more stress on you than you do if you are hauling it on a summer day. And one of the concerns I have is that we are really talking about two different things here today. The first four witnesses on the panel, called by the majority, are making a common point, which is that the rules that are being proposed are bad for business. You all agree with that point, don't you? Okay. Well, in, a, in an ideal world, the best rule for business would be no hours of service limitation where you were free to set your own time frame, and yet you are shaking your head, Mr. Nagel, because you know there is a problem with that. Because there are backside costs, liability costs, that will come if we don't have some reasonable restriction on hours of duty. Is that correct? So what we are really arguing about is whether the rule that has been proposed or the rule that is in place make more sense for the purpose that this agency was set up to address. And if you look at that purpose, it is not called the Federal Motor Carrier Profit Administration. It is called the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, and it is to set up the rules of the road that give people a level playing field that protect both the interest of the people who want to haul commerce across the roads of this country, which I was proud to do, 
and also protect the consumers who use that same highway and it may not be involved in that system. Now, Mr. Miller, you made the point that one of the problems facing the industry, which I am acutely aware of, is a shortage of qualified, safe drivers. Do you remember saying that? Now, here is what I don't understand. We are in a recession now. There are a lot of people looking for work, 9 percent unemployment in this country. Why is the industry not able to find enough qualified, safe drivers if that is the case? Sir, I don't have a good explanation for you. I can tell you that we are a premium driving operation. We operate a safe, legal fleet. We very rarely bump the 11 hours. Um, however, I go through an average of 500 applications to put a qualified driver in my truck, and that is my concern, that, that people will be forced to put drivers that are not qualified and that are unsafe on the road. And that is my point. I am as sympathetic as you can believe one of the problems is that there is a huge shortage of qualified drivers. And I think economists would tell us that perhaps one of the reasons for that shortage is that people looking for work do not find the workplace conditions and the pay worth the risk of trying to become qualified to drive a truck, which I think is an honorable and noble occupation and one I was proud to be part of. But if we are looking at one of the reasons that may be contributing to that, I would argue it could, do to, it could have something to do with the hours of service requirement. And one of the things we know, um, Mr. Jasney and, and Dr. David, is this isn't unique to the trucking industry. We have seen the same issue come up in resident physician duty hours as people have become concerned that patient safety is being compromised by forcing resident physicians to work long hours without appropriate rest, and that compromises their ability to do their job effectively and impacts patient safety. So having heard the testimony today, I would like both of you to respond to the public safety concern and how that relates to the ability to hire qualified, safe drivers. Well, Mr. Braley, working conditions are always uh, um, an important issue, certainly in shift work. We have seen that in studies of, of shift work all over the world. It is the working conditions. In these specific areas, if you look at the uh, economist, um, uh, Michael Belzer wrote a book called Sweatshops on Wheels, and he is essentially saying that these are the modern-day sweatshops because of those working conditions, having to deliver just in time all the time, being under the gun, driving longer hours. And for many non-contract and non-union drivers, they are exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act. Dr. David? I mean, I don't think there is any question that reducing the amount of on-duty time would reduce the number of accidents. The question is how much and is it worth it? I mean, we have a rule now that is more restricted than rules used to be. Those rules were more restrictive than the rules before that, and before that there weren't any rules. So the question is where do you stop? And cost-benefit is one piece of information you can use to get there um, as long as it is done properly. And just so that I am clear on one of the principal points of your testimony, your testimony was that your economic analysis of the trade-offs between the current rule and the proposed rule is there were actual economic benefits to going to the proposed rule. Well, there would be reduced crashes, but there would be increased costs. So uh, I, I calculated that on net the increased costs would outweigh the value of the reduced crashes. Um, that is obviously sensitive to the assumptions you use and the, how restrictive the rule is. But under the assumptions the FMC, FMCSA uses, I calculated that the cost would be higher. But the point that you also made is that those costs include opportunity. In other words, the added cost of transportation for these same goods and services could result in new jobs becoming available, taking people off of unemployment making the taxpayers of this country pay less of that burden and having those new employees paying into Social Security, Medicare, State and, and Federal taxes as well. I mean, th this rule isn't going to be undone when we come out of a recession, so I would never recommend regulation in order to solve an unemployment problem. But uh, in terms of the number of people actually driving trucks, that could change. But the point <laughs> is, is that this is a, a, an analysis about the tradeoffs between safety on the one hand and what is uh, a good business requirement on the other hand, and you are always going to have some of those tradeoffs. That is absolutely true. 
Mr. You, Mr. Mr. David, you are not the only one who has concluded that, the, that there is going to be a, a significant increased costs. Didn't the, the Obama administration itself has said there is going to be increased costs with this new rule? Absolutely. Uh, uh, the number one of only a handful of rules that, that they have said is going to cost at least over a billion dollars, correct? The agency's numbers were about a billion dollars in increased costs. A billion dollars in increased costs at a time when we got 9 percent unemployment, correct? As I said, it is a billion dollars today and it will continue to be a billion under their assumptions. Right. Thank forward. you. Turn now to the gentlelady from uh, New York. Oh, I am sorry. That is right. The gentleman from Tennessee is first. I apologize. Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nagel, can you tell us about the steps your company takes to help ensure driver safety and health? I didn't hear the last word. Uh, can you uh, tell me about the steps your company takes to help ensure driver safety and health? Well, I don't know about health. I mean, we're required to go through regular physicals and so forth. But uh, just our company alone, we do not have the onboard electronic recorders. So when our drivers call in every morning, they have to advise our operations people how much longer they have uh, to drive for the day and when their their next ten hour break is up for for their sleep. So we schedule pickups and deliveries around that availability of their time and, and for their sleep. Okay. Well, let me, let me ask, uh, do you think there is a pressing need for this rule, or do you believe the current rules allow your drivers to balance safety and driver health? I think the current rules um, are a lot better than what is being proposed. I would say that if you can add or, or bring back in the split sleeper berth provision, that will even add additional good rest and solid rest time. Do you think there is anything else motivating DOT to propose these rules besides safety and health concerns? Well, there is a tremendous influence from uh, union LTL drivers that they are not impacted at all by the 34-hour reset provision. And some of those carriers, I, I would well, I, I would think they'd be more adversely affected by the 11 to 10 hour change. But they're taking studies based on a small percentage of drivers that don't represent the typical motor carrier industry, and trying to broad brush some of those regulations over them. So um, there are definitely other interests that are being represented in this proposal. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kisa, I will ask you the same question. Do you think there is anything else motivating DOT? I, uh, to tell you the truth, I don't know. I am um, not aware of anything. Okay. That is fair. Uh, Mr. Jancy, uh, do you acknowledge that trucking fatalities and injuries have declined since 2004 when the current hours of service rules have been in effect? They have declined. Uh, they went up initially the first two years in 2004 and 2005 that the rule went into effect. They have come down in the last two years, but it has been shown that it has nothing to do with the hours of service rule itself, per do you, se. Do you acknowledge that the number of truck miles traveled has increased since that time? Yes. Okay. Do you acknowledge that registered Except large trucks have also increased since that time? The registered number has gone up, although last year and the year before, the number of vehicle miles traveled for large trucks for combination trucks have gone down. Overall, the LTL trucks have made up the difference, so VMT has remained about flat. But for the vehicles that are, are bump up against the hours of service rule most, that VMT has gone down last year and the year before. Okay. Based on these facts, it would appear that the 2008 hours of service regulations have been and continue to be very effective at improving highway safety. Is it your essential argument that you can never have too much regulation? No, not at all. You need the right regulations, and what we have now is not the right regulations for the reasons I have stated in the record. They, they are, are contradictory of the scientific uh, evidence in the record. Uh, they uh, were disputed by the Court of Appeals as being uh, illogical uh, and of questionable validity. Uh, and I would like to point out that in 2000 there was a notice of proposed rulemaking that actually would have applied different hours of service regimes to different parts of the industry, and Congress told the agency that they couldn't do that. Okay. Do you believe that the regulation should have to at least contribute more benefit to, to society than it costs society? I believe that it is clear from the regulatory analysis that these do. Okay. Uh, you know, driver fatigue can be a cause uh, or factor in any accident. Do you agree? Uh, 
whether yes. it's passenger there, vehicle. There are, most crashes are multifactorial incidents. Okay. Are you aware that according to DOT's own data that driver fatigue does not rank among the most common factors for truck driver related fatalities? Yes, but they, they also underestimate the uh, uh, percentage of crashes that involve uh, fatigue. Okay. Are you aware that the uh, percentage of fatalities due to pas passenger vehicle driver fatigue is higher than to truck fatigue, truck driver fatigue? Passenger fatigue is higher. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know that statistic. Okay. Well, um, I guess in light of the fact that uh, there, there's more fatigue related to accidents and deaths with passenger cars, do you think that there should be drive time restrictions on passenger vehicles? It is a different operating environment, and, and most passenger vehicles are, are regulated by States. They are not regulated by, uh, uh, they are not a regulated industry. So it would be difficult to do, and it is up to States. To, okay. to do that. Well, well I think the point is we all want to drive on safer highways, whether it is trucks, cars, and the, the point is where do we find a balance in, in regulation. So that is why we are all here, but I am out of time. Thank you. Right. But uh, going back to the 2003 final rule, that from in its conception was wrong, and we are trying to correct that, and we have been trying to correct that for the last eight years and save some lives. Okay. Well, for the record, uh, the truck percentage is 1.4 and passengers is 1.7. I yield back. I now yield myself five minutes. Um, for the record, I would like to submit for the record um, a statement from the Retail Industries Leaders Association and Kraft Foods, both who have expressed respect for DOT's intent to prevent crashes, but feel the proposed rule falls short of accomplishing the goal without objection. Um, first of all, Mr. Slattery and um, Mrs. Woods have left the room and the chairman had expressed our sympathies for their losses. But I think as I sit here, there is not a person in this room, whether you are a Republican or a Democrat, we are Americans and we want our highways safe. And to think that we don't is really disingenuous. So I think we start with that premise. We all have family members out there and we want them to be safe. But every time a rule or a regulation is passed or a statute, there is a loss of freedom. So in my mind, when we do that, we need to justify it. So as I look at these regulations and I see that the, the statistics have improved with the current regulations that are in place, I say to myself, why are we, why are we taking these steps? What, what is it that is motivating this? When, when the statistics, and we all agree, and, and so much of this job is balance, balancing safety balancing our economy and trying to keep get our economy back on track and, and uh, be prosperous. So when I look at the numbers and, and the, the statistics, in 1979 there were 7,054 fatalities. In 2009 there were 3,619 fatalities, almost a 50 percent decrease. In 1979 um, there were 0.461 fatalities per 100 million miles. In 2009, they were 0.123, a decrease of almost 75 percent. So it appears to me that the current regulations are moving in the right direction. Um, they are making the highways more safer, and they are becoming safer. They're, uh, the fatalities are down. And in the, in the meantime, we are not disadvantaging or um, creating more uh, obstructions and more regulations for our industry. So then my first question, Mr. Jasny, is why? Why are, why are we want to change something that, that appears to be working, the statistics towards more safe highways is working? Because just, just as if the, the Dow Jones goes up on any particular day, individual stocks may be going the other way. In this case, while there are a lot of regulations that we have supported and the agency has finally come to adopt in recent years that are improving safety and helping, uh, this one is swimming upstream. This one is going against the current. This one is not proved to help with fatigue. The statistics and even the agency say in the notice of proposed rulemaking that there is no connection between the recent downturn, which is probably, if you look at my Appendix C, the chart uh, that I included from the uh, Motor Carrier Safety Administration shows that the uh, crashes are not 
result of fatigue, but more for what are the economic conditions and the downturn in long-haul vehicle miles of travel. So we're, there are still somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people out there who are dying in crashes involving trucks, and most of the victims in those crashes, 97 percent, are passenger car victims, people in passenger cars who die, not necessarily the truck drivers. And so the, there is still a, about 1,000 lives out there we think that can be saved by a better rule. Mr. David, or do, excuse me, Dr. David, would you like to respond to that? Well, I, I addressed this uh, to a question Mr. Braley brought up earlier, which is that clearly restricting the hours can have some effect on, on fatalities and on large truck crashes generally. The question is, at what point do you stop? And that is a judgment that has to be made based on the data. Um, and, you know, that, so that, uh, I mean, there is no question that there could be some improvement. The question is whether it is a large improvement or a small one. Two things, I am a freshman here, uh, and two things that, that constantly impress me down here is, number one, the disconnect between Washington and, in, in particular, in this committee, businesses. And so when we look at these proposed rules, I am always concerned that the, the stakeholders aren't at the table, that, that the bureaucracies and, and the agencies are making these rules that affect the businesses. Did any of you participate in or offer up any or have any input into these proposed rules, the first four? Dr. David, uh, when um, Mr. Jasney talked about the Court of Appeals striking down uh, the, the last regulation, I would like for you to just comment on that. I am sorry. I, I don't have any opinion about that. My understanding is, Mr. Jasney, do you know why they struck, why, why they struck down that regulation? Yes. The, the regulation, the initial decision struck it down because they did not consider the health of the drivers when imposing a rule that would affect drivers. And that so, was the so first it was round. procedural rather than substantive? No, that was, it was substantive because there was a statutory uh, mandate to consider that issue, and the agency did not consider the issue. The Court then went on in an unusual dicta to point out all the problems that involved the substantive issues regarding safety, regarding the 11 hours, regarding the 34 hours that the Court saw, the court saw as problems when the case came back. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but sure. my time is running out okay. here, and I, I do want to ask uh, Dr. David one more question. Uh, Dr. David, you mentioned in your testimony that there were several errors in uh, DOT's uh, methodology. Can you just expound on that for us a little bit? Well, uh, there were a number of cases where assumptions were made without any kind of basis. There were, for example, calculation errors where something as simple as rounding a number for no reason can mean a difference of $100 million in the regulation. Um, there were several other cases which I outlined in my, uh, in my report. They total up to being worth several hundred million dollars per year, which could make the difference between a positive benefit and a negative benefit for this rule. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you think DOT's cost-benefit analysis rates in terms of accuracy? Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I've not been called upon to do that before. I, I, uh, describe, the, I describe what I find as either mistakes or assumptions that are made that, that don't seem appropriate given current data, and I think you would have to make your own judgment about uh, how it grades relative to the other ones. If I may, I'd like to submit for the record a rebuttal that my organization has drafted with regard to the Edgeworth analysis that points out the flaws in their reasoning. Without objection, thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I am out of time. I now yield to Mr. Labrador. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Nagel, th there was some discussion just a few minutes ago with the good gentleman from Ohio, uh, who I respect very highly. Um, about your safety record. And I, it always amazes me. I, I'm also a freshman here. Uh, and I'm, I sit here and we talk about new regulations and we talk about the cost of new regulations. And it always amazes me that there's always testimony that under existing regulations, we're catching people who are making mistakes. And we're, as you indicated, you fired a bunch of people who made those mistakes. And yet, we have this administration wanting more and more regulation when it seems like the regulations that are already in place are doing their job. Um, would you comment on that a little bit? It seems like you didn't need new regulation to, number one, the people who, who were penalized were penalized under existing regulations, 
And you, as a businessman, didn't need new regulation to tell you that you needed to get rid of those people. Can, can you comment on that a little bit, if I'm making any sense at all? No, and uh, you are. Uh, the regulations as they currently exist, okay, um, what had happened is through CSA enforcement, the driver's background became much more important and much more public. And so we have to take that into consideration. So at that time, now we place greater emphasis on internal audits and internal logs. And uh, that's where we found a lot of these occurrences. And, um, uh, and that's why we got rid of those. But in terms of would we have taken those steps knowing that this proposed uh, regulation were in the, uh, in the forefront? We would have taken those steps regardless. So I, I really think that uh, just adding additional regulations, additional regulations, um, when less than 2 percent of the trucking companies have actually been audited and checked, okay, we are doing a poor job enforcing the current regulations on the other 98 percent of the carriers. Okay, can you stop right there? That is what frustrates me the most, is we have regulators who are not doing their job, we do a poor job with the current regulations, and we think that the solution is to add more regulations instead of just doing our damn job, instead of just doing the things that we should be doing right now. We do it in the trucking industry, we do it in every single industry, and what we have is an administration that thinks by adding more and more regulations we are going to have more safety when if they just did their job, they just actually enforced the regulations that are already in place, we would have the safety that we need. What, what do you think about that, Mr. Mackey? Well, I would just say that reiterate the point that several of us made is we have been down this road four times in the last 12 years, and it is not an issue of not enough regulation. It is just it is, it's hard for companies, again, particularly in our industry, we are bakers first, not you know, trucking companies. Um, we want to know what the, the rules are and, we, and that work for us. And, and instead of changing the rules, moving the, the goalposts back and forth that we have had in the last 12 years, um, some certainty there would be enormously helpful. And, and right now these regulations seem to be working, so why don't we stick with them for a while? Exactly. And it seems like they are working. We are catching the offenders. We are catching the people that are not doing the, the right job. And, and instead what we have is a bunch of eggheads telling us that if we do some stupid formula that we are going to have a little bit more, more safety when I believe you have your name. Do, do all of you have your names on your trucks? It is your reputation that is on the line if there is no safety, right? So, so what are the market forces that help you to make these decisions? Not, not regulatory forces, but market forces. But what do you do, Mr. Is it Keesaw? Mr. Keesaw, you have your name on your truck. Yeah, we do. So, so what, what do you think about every morning, not the formulas that the eggheads are going to give us, but what do you think about every morning when you think about truck safety? Um, well, because we have our name on our trucks, we think about you know, what reputation we have out there to the grocery industry and you know, our customers that go into, um, into, in, you know, into our stores that have the same name on it. So we know we are very visible out there, and, and uh, we want the safest fleet. Uh, Associated Foods has gone to the extent of putting electronic uh, recorders in their, in their uh, tractors uh, more than a decade ago so that we could have the safest fleet out there. Uh, we also uh, take uh, quality of life for the drivers very seriously because we know they are the ones at the end of the day that will make sure that uh, our roads are safe. Now, do all of you, I, I heard, I think it was Mr. Miller who said that you are having a hard time finding employer, employees, is that correct? Qualified, safe driver, well, that is correct. Are all of you having that problem? Every single one of you. So who is going to take the additional 40,000 jobs that apparently are going to be created by this regulation if you can't even find enough qualified workers under the existing law? I am sorry, that is just a rhetorical question, but again, <laughs> eggheads. Are trying to, are running this country instead of actual real people who understand what's happening here in America and how jobs are created and how jobs are destroyed. Thank you. May I interject a comment? Certainly. Yeah. And I yes. <laughs> I think one of one like of the, the concerns that I have in, in in all of the reporting when we we see fatigue related accidents, there's there is no. Um, 
correlation that at least I have seen as to whether that is a compliance related accident. In other words, okay, the driver was fatigued, but was he fatigued because he was not following the existing laws and violating those laws? The second is the topic of sleep apnea. We are just beginning to explore that topic, and as well as CSA 2010. We haven't even begun to see the benefits of that, which is only a year into fruition, which is probably the most sweeping, um, comprehensive uh, method that the uh, FMCSA has taken at looking at carriers, as well as providing us a tool to manage our carriers and our fleets better in the, in the data that it provides to us. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank, thank you. you. I thank the gentleman from Idaho for his good questions. Um, I want to thank our first panel for your, uh, for your great testimony and your willingness to answer the questions and be with us today. We are going to dismiss you now and we will get to our, uh, our second panel. So thank you all again. Thank you. Looks like it's just me. Thank you again. Well, thank you. Thank you.